thank you very much for uh, inviting me. This is a very new format. I thank uh, Galia and other uh, organizers of this seminar, which is extremely kind of you. And this is my first attempt, so I, I'm, I'm very certain I'm going to do a lot of stupid things in manipulation because I have never used this sort of um, uh, forum to, to give a seminar talk. Okay, so I want to talk of these uh, borderline uh, uh, Sobolev inequalities, and they seem to have uh, many applications in mathematical physics. And I would like to be actually spending a lot of time trying to tell you about how these borderline inequalities, uh, Sobolev inequalities, also work on uh, Riemannian symmetric spaces and other types of spaces, and they have applications there too. Okay, so uh, the main result uh, in this inequality will be uh, some sort of a duality inequality. And this uh, duality inequality is actually going to work on Riemannian symmetric spaces and also on these Carnot groups which occur uh, like the Heisenberg group, group of uh, nilpotent groups associated to finite type domains and so on and so forth. The Rn analog of this inequality is the one due to Burgan disease. And uh, this work that I'm going to talk about is a uh, part of a joint work with Van Schaftingen and Polan Jung, uh, who is uh, currently at the Australian National University. And Van Schaftingen is at the uh, uni University of um, Louvain-Lenau in Belgium. Okay. So uh, let me remind you of some background, which is helpful in understanding this inequality. So we have, uh, we have uh, these uh, Sobolev spaces, which are the homogeneous Sobolev spaces, which is uh, the completion of uh, smooth functions with compact support in, in this norm. And uh, we all know that uh, if you take this Sobolev space, then it embeds into uh, this LP space. This is the so-called Sobolev inequality. And in fact, the remarkable thing about it is that it is also valid when P is one. So, so now the uh, question is, uh, what happens when P is equal to N? Now in one dimension, this is actually something we all know. We teach our calculus students this inequality when P is N, and it follows from what is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. That is, if you take a function with compact support, you can write it as the indefinite integral of f prime, and then when c, uh, when uh, uh, p is equal to n, uh, then this number turns out to be L infinity, and you can see that uh, the L infinity norm is controlled by the uh, L1 norm of f prime in 1D. But unfortunately, this does not happen in higher dimension. So in higher dimension, there are, there are some difficulties. And um, so uh, let me point out to you um, this simple example that shows that in two dimensions already false. So you take this function log log one over x and you multiply by a cutoff function which looks like this. And you can, obviously this function is not in L infinity, but you, you can very simply check that the gradient is in L2. And this function has come back support. So that inequality, which I was telling you about, completely fails already in dimension two. And there are some sort of uh, ways to remedy this. And one such famous remedy is the Moser-Trudinger inequality, which I have written down for the sphere. And this is a fundamental tool in conformal geometry, and in particular in the study of what is called the Nirenberg problem on S2, where you want to solve this equation, which is the equation of prescribing the Gauss curvature on, sphere, on the sphere. So you have the regular round metric, and you want to modify it by a conformal factor, so that after you modify it by the conformable factor, then the Gauss curvature of the new metric is equal to uh, this prescribed function kx. So in, in the study of this problem, this inequality that I have written down, the moser trudinger inequality is uh, still, still valid. 
So, um, so going back here, I mean, it is at this end point that most of my talk will be focused on. Okay, so, so now uh, what is the burgan brazis inequality? So there are actually, uh, the, the first paper, which is really uh, my principal focus, there is another paper where they extended this inequality in, uh, in, in a very powerful way. And for that, uh, that other inequality, uh, I do not have an answer in my setting. For this type of inequality, which I'm showing you, I, I have uh, some answers. So what you have here is uh, you take uh, a function uh, uh, in LN and you want to solve this equation. It's, uh, so it's an underdetermined equation because you can always modify this equation by adding this equation is underdetermined because if you have a solution, then you can modify this by adding something, a vector field, which is divergence free. And what they are saying is that you can solve this equation with this sort of a bound. So in other words, you are allowed uh, to modify and then for some solution after modification, you, you can find a solution that is, that is actually bounded, okay? Now, it's not very hard to do this result for y in, in, in this space. Now, if the previous result were true that this space embeds into L infinity, then of course this result would be completely trivial because you would just say, oh, but W dot one N embeds into L infinity. So there is nothing in this result. But the point is that that inequality, the hypothetical inequality is false. And so therefore I find that this is a remarkable result, okay? So you can also think of this as a result uh, for solving some um, with estimates, with the solving with estimates, uh, some part of the hodge diram complex. And this will come back to us because in, in the setup that uh, we are all uh, looked at the problem, there have been many applications in recent uh, months by Pierre Pansu uh, to what is called the Ruman complex in contact geometry. So they are actually using our estimates to uh, do this sort of cohomological results with the estimates. And I will say a few words of that because uh, you can then look at what they are doing because that is not central to us because we, we are really focused on the analysis, not on the other aspects of contact geometry and so on. Though I might say a few words to how this really comes about. Okay, so, uh, so, so this was, so the burgan brazis actually uh, did more. They can actually look at uh, higher degree forms. And uh, the point is that you can look at uh, Q forms and you can then solve this result with estimates. And uh, the, 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 the first result was this with L infinity bounds, but later in uh, some very complicated, this, this proof is also very complicated, but then in another very complicated uh, paper, they can extend it where they can take, instead of just being in L infinity, it is in the intersection of these two spaces. So you can find a Y which is not only bounded, but also it is in W dot one N. So as far as this sort of result goes, uh, one Shaftingen found a simpler proof. And naively speaking, uh, I would say that if I want to give uh, some idea uh, I would say that this proof is based on some principle of slicing. So I'm not going, to, I'm very vague about this. And maybe when I say a little bit about proofs, I might come back to this statement. So what is this result of Van Schaftingen that he found? So he, this is what I call the duality. And this, this duality has extremely powerful consequences as, and I will show you one simple example already in RN that there is, there is much more and, and you will see already some very striking applications of, of, of this uh, I, uh, circle of ideas. So uh, his result is that you take a, a, a smooth vector field. I mean, this smoothness is so that I don't have to say in the sense of distribution, but you know, you can always talk of all of these as a, 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 in a sense of distributions. For example, 
then you take that the divergence of f is zero. So this can be thought of in the sense of distributions, all of this. Then you can take any vector field and you take this dot product, then this dot product is controlled by this. So here you see you have L1, okay? So now you say, ah, but then I will just take the absolute value inside, okay? If you take the absolute value inside, you can pull out the L1 norm, you can pull out the L infinity norm of phi, and if your uh, false inequality that L infinity, uh, uh, this guy is embedded in L infinity were true, then this would have become completely trivial. Because, but that we know is not true because I produced for you a counter example in uh, 2D. In 2D, I showed you that uh, you cannot control the L infinity norm by the gradient of the L2 norm. So this is not completely non-trivial inequality. So here, this is what I am saying. This would have been a trivial inequality if this embed into L infinity. So this is a, a remedy of the failure of uh, this critical Sobolev embedding. So, you, so in other words, um, if the divergence of uh, this vector field is zero, then this, this guy, which is in Ln, is seeing this as if it is an L infinity function. Normally, it's not L infinity function, but uh, because of this condition, somehow it, it, it's uh, pretending that uh, this L1 function here is actually, uh, you can actually do this uh, dot product. So what is this saying? This is actually saying, this is another way to think about it, is that if the divergence of the vector field is zero, then any L1 function is in the dual of this space. It's in the dual space of that. So this is W1n. So it is in the dual of that. So it is in W minus one, n by n minus one. That's what it is saying, okay? So there is a very powerful consequence of this. So let me explain that consequence. And so, so, so let, me, let me point out this application right away. So we all are familiar with this, uh, this equation. Minus Laplace n equals the Dirac mass. And we know that the solution of this is the Green's function. And if you take the gradient, it's that. And the gradient certainly is not in L n by n minus one. But now let's try to ask another question where the right hand side is not just any old L1 object or a distribution. It is a, it is a vector field whose divergence is zero. So if it's, vector, if it's a vector field with divergence is zero, you catch this inequality that failed here. This inequality now is true. So you see why is this true? Because the di we know from that, uh, from that uh, uh, duality bracket, divergence f is zero, f is in L1. So therefore f is in W minus one, n by n minus one. Therefore singular integrals of calderon zygmunt theory now operate. Before they would not operate because you were a borderline. Now they do operate and you catch this inequality. So you see already, that you, you get back something which you could not in, in, in principle. And then you think a little bit harder and you see divergence zero, this is appearing all over in fluid mechanics. Therefore, we get all these applications that I'm going to talk about. All right, now I give you another application and this application is due to bourgain brigitte So it's a very nice uh, uh, vector field whose divergence is zero take a closed curve. So it's very important here in this that the curve is closed. And now you look at this measure on this. So this is uh, the unit tangent vector. Assume the curve is smooth and it's also rectifiable and so on. Now I, I claim that this, this object here has divergence zero. Why? Because you test it with any smooth function and you integrate by parts and this is zero. Why is this zero? Because the curve is smooth and closed. So the closeness comes in to check the divergence zero. Therefore, the previous inequality applies. And if you look at this equation, then the gradient, sorry, I missed it. This is L n by n minus one norm. In the L by n minus one norm is controlled by the L one norm, which is the arc length. So that is one another, a first application of what uh, this result was about. Okay. So, uh, 
Uh, now, uh, this inequality can also be used to prove uh, versions of the so-called Gagliardo-Nirenberg inequality for differential forms. And this was, uh, this re remind you, this is the famous Gagliardo-Nirenberg inequality. And also I remind you something about this, the way this inequality is proved. It's proved by integrating along lines, right? So in other words, you are using the fundamental theorem of calculus along lines. So in our case, we are not using lines, but we are using some sort of a foliation, okay? And so there is some, some, some commonality. This is not the way, by the way, this idea of using slices and foliation is not the way Burgan Brazis did it. They used a very complicated little wood paley argument. And even for the other second uh, harder result is also a very complicated little wood paley argument. I would say a tiny bit of little wood paley creeps into our argument, but not to the extent that you need the full flesh theory. Uh, so, so now the fact that yeah, I was saying something about uh, differential forms, this is a result which is based on the result of Burgan Brazis uh, due to Lanzani and Stein who sort of uh, looked at this result and extended it for uh, Q forms. Okay, so this, this is, so you have variants of the previous result, not just for uh, vector fields and so on. You can even do it for Q forms. Okay, now what are the other developments? Uh, when shafting then uh, could uh, do this for higher order divergences uh, for fractional uh, Sobol F spaces. And then combined with, uh, with myself, uh, we could extend all these results to Heisenberg group and to other nilpotent groups of this type. And these results were extended by Polam to uh, using uh, the um, Follenstein machine, he could extend it to pseudo convex domains. And in this setup, uh, Polam and Iwan could ex uh, extend the results for homogeneous groups of Burgan Brazis, the second result. So, you know, that result can be extended. Uh, another application is that many of these, res all these results that you saw on RN can be used to obtain uh, uh, some sort of sharp Strickhardt's inequalities for Wave and Schrodinger equations. Uh, where the right hand side has divergence zero. And I will come back to that because that is how uh, these, these, these inequalities have applications to Maxwell equation. So in electromagnetism, and then I will explain a bit about how that works. Okay, so here is the result of Van Schaftingen and myself uh, for these what are now called Carnot groups. So you have a nilpotent group and in, in the fallen uh, Stein um, set up, it's a direct sum of vector spaces. Then you take the bracket of VI, a vector space in VI and VJ, it's contained in VI plus J and so on. And you have a vector field which is uh, only dependent on the first guy. So its components are in this direction. So it, 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 these are not involved. And when I talk of the divergence, I am talking of the vector fields here and of the divergence of the components, since the components are here, the vector, so let's say this has k dimensions, then f will be f1 up to fk. This is spanned by vector fields x1 up to xk, and you simply take xi, fi, sum equal to zero. And if you do that, then you exactly have the same sort of uh, duality that, that I uh, spoke about. So this is called the subgradient. That means you only are using the vector fields here to define the gradient. And Q is some uh, homogeneous dimension that is usually associated to this group. And if you are familiar, in the case of the Heisenberg group, it is four. And so, uh, so what I want to also point out is that there are also some second order uh, operators uh, associated here that we could also prove this. At the, point that we, at the point when we wrote the paper, we did not know what the second order operator was, but later on, uh, Pansu in his work uh, pointed out that this is exactly the operator which occurs in the middle dimension in the so-called Rumin complex in contact geometry. And he has been working with this long, many, many papers on what he calls LP cohomology. 
I really do not uh, know much about uh, this, but these LP cohomology estimates are based on this uh, inequality. So this inequality furnishes uh, all the estimates they need, uh, Pan Pierre Pansu, Bruno Franchi in Bologna and so on, and their collaborators, they are, they are using this, this, um, this uh, key uh, estimate to produce all the different estimates in, in the Rumin complex. Okay. Now, uh, I just again want to point out, you have a similar application like before, that you, you solve this equation. So instead of the Laplacian, you have the sub-Laplacian. F is this vector field, which is spanned by the vectors in V1. The divergence is zero. And as before, the, the subgradient of U in this norm is controlled by the L1 norm of F. And you can also talk of the application to closed curves, but now the closed curves have to be Legendrian. Legendrian simply means that the tangent, uh, tangent to the curves simply lies in the contact plane. It does not go in outside the contact plane. So at every point, the tangent to the curve is lying in the contact plane. So if you have a closed curve like that, then you have a similar estimate where this F is to be replaced by the arc length. Okay, all right. Now let's go on to symmetric spaces, which is uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, one important uh, point. And so um, uh, what, I, what I have here is that uh, you have, um, a, a Riemannian manifold uh, with a metric. And on this Riemannian mat manifold with a metric, you have all these other objects, like you have the metric, you have the norm, you have the volume, you have the gradient, the divergence, and the connection, and so on. So you, so you have this. So this is a, so far, it's a general Riemannian manifold. But the general Riemannian manifold for, for the moment is uh, not, not uh, amenable to our methods. So we need to assume a bit more. So what we need to assume is that at every point M, there is a global isometry that fixes this point and reverses geodesics through X naught. This is what is called a global symmetric space. So, uh, uh, so, so there is a, a, a group of isometries and you are looking at the component which contains the identity. And we will assume that this two things that this group is non-compact, has finite center, and is called any semi-simple. So semi-simplicity simply means that there is, a, there is this uh, Cartan form, which is a trace uh, of this composition, and this Cartan form is non-degenerate. And there is a very famous classification of Cartan who really classified all the symmetric spaces. So basically what you need to know is not only you need to have a classification of the Lie algebra, but also a classification of all involutions on that. And so this is a very great uh, classification and some idea of, of how this classification goes about can be seen in the book of Helgerson. So Helgerson has a book, Differential Geometry and Symmetric Spaces, which is a very old classic. And there you will find a classification of that. Our proof does not rely on this classification for geometry. Okay. So, uh, so what is very important for us is that there is this object called uh, the Iwasawa decomposition. This plays a very important role because it fits in with this sort of slicing that we want to do eventually. Okay, so what we, are, uh, we do is that for every point X naught in, in this um, manifold that we were looking at, uh, you look at the stabilizer subgroup of, of, uh, of of G, so the, the, so you look at those those um, isometries that preserve X naught. So this is going to be some maximal compact object. I'm going to write this out in in some in this special case. So what you can do is, and this is nothing else but actually Gram-Schmidt. Okay, what what we teach our calculus students is QR factorization. So in a sense, uh, this Iwasawa decomposition is nothing but QR factorization. Okay but done in this setup of the Lie algebra. So in the case of uh, this particular group, which I will use as a group to sort of uh, show you, uh, give you a rough idea of the proof, uh, the maximal compact is actually the group of rotations. And A is a diagonal subgroup. 
So it's a uh, diagonal means the matrices involved are diagonal matrix. And N is, a, is the one which is a nil potent. So it has one, one on the, on the diagonal, and then it has a, an, something off diagonal. So might be, I, I will explain this to you by, yeah. So here is what is happening. So here is the Iwasawa decomposition for SL2R. So here you have the rotations. These are the dilations and um, just diagonal guys. And these are the nil potent guys. And it's very important to understand what are the orbits. So you see this, we all know, acts on the Poincare upper half plane by linear fractional transformations. And if you look at this n part, the n part is basically going from z to z plus x. So if you look at the orbits, the orbits are these horizontal lines. If you look at the a part, then the orbits are these vertical lines, and these vertical lines are exactly the geodesy. These horizontal lines are called horocycles. So there are, this is not the only, only horocycle. So horocycles are essentially circles whose center is at infinity. And if you look at all the geodesics coming out from this point, this distinguished point, then these geodesics are at 90 degrees, at right angles to this horocycle. So these, these horocycles will play a very important role for us in, in the proof, okay? So the, the dimension of the A part is called the rank, the real rank. So in the case of SL2R, it's one parameter. There was only one lambda that you saw in that slide. So therefore, uh, uh, therefore it is an example of a rank one symmetric space. And for us, what we need to do eventually is do some sort, not a very hard, but some sort of little wood paley on the end part, on those horocycles. You want to do some sort of decomposition. And this decomposition, like in little wood paley, is to break up a function into its low frequency and high frequency part. Okay, so a few more words about this uh, Cartan decomposition. So, as I said earlier, this, uh, this Cartan decomposition uh, is an involution. So it's a map theta. It's a map theta. And uh, in fact, uh, here I actually have written down. So it is this map theta. So theta is an involution. That means theta square is the identity. And in particular, you can think of A going to minus A transpose in this particular case. So, so what you need to do is uh, you need to uh, take uh, semi-simple Lie algebras and classify all the involutions on, on that semi-simple Lie algebra, classify the uh, Lie algebra and the involutions, and then the, the fixed point of the involution will give you the uh, Lie algebra for the maximal compact, and then this corresponds to theta of x equals minus x. This is the uh, called the P part. So this part corresponds to A and N. It corresponds to the tangent space of A and N. So, so uh, what is th the manifold? Well, as I said, the stabilizer group, the stabilizer group is K. So the manifold on which I'm interested in establishing all my inequalities and so on is G mod K, which is in the case of the uh, SL2R, it is exactly the Poincare upper half plane, because if you take SL2R, it acts on the Poincare upper half plane by linear fractional transformation. If you take the point I and you say, what are those linear fractional transformations that fix I, you find that those are all the rotations, SO2. So if I take G, SL2R, mod out SO2, that is going to be left with a n so that p part is the tangent space of the a n part or identified with the tangent space of m and so that is exactly the Poincare upper half plane so the so this is actually identified with the tangent space of m it's very important for us that this m has no closed geodesics you know, somehow you want to use fundamental theorem of calculus somewhere in some form, and if you have a closed geodesic, you get into trouble. So the fact of the matter is that this uh, symmetric space of non-compact type 
are actually simply connected and have no closed geodesics. And this is extremely important for us. As you saw that in this example that I showed you of SL2R, you had these vertical lines. There are other geodesics too, but the vertical lines don't bend and come, come around on itself. So therefore, this is very good for us in doing the analysis. So if you want to take all of this and try to extend it eventually to a Riemannian manifold, and you want to follow this proof, then you might have to make all these assumptions. Uh, we, we, we didn't do any of that. Uh, and if you want to prove this, this sort of duality result on a general Riemannian manifold, then, uh, then the other alternative would be to find a completely different proof than the one that that is that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, so here's the main theorem, and the main theorem is that you take any Riemannian symmetric space of non-compact type, okay, and you take any smooth vector field. So this smoothness, as I said to you, is just a way so that I don't want to say distribution, that uh, you know this sort of thing. So this is so as to make it less technical. So this is in the, this, the, the divergence is to be taken in the sense of this uh, metric here. There is, this is a very well-defined notion. You take any compactly supported smooth vector field phi on M and you have this bracket, uh, this duality. And so, so, this is, uh, so what happens here is exactly the same result that you find that we saw in RN and we saw on nilpotent groups and so on and so forth. The proof here is quite a lot involved. It's not uh, anymore, uh, there, is a, there is a heavy use of uh, geometric arguments here. And also, uh, fortunately, I was a little frightened, but it turned out that the amount of uh, manipulation of what are called root systems here was not all that much and something that we could handle with minimum amount of knowledge of algebra. Okay, so uh, so uh, so now uh, there is a, a straightforward application, and that is you take a Riemannian symmetric space of non-compact type, you take any vector field such that uh, this is bounded, and you take this dot product. So this Laplacian is the Laplace Beltrami operator of this, and you re remember you had this result where this side was L1, and then you had to. Um, uh, take the, uh, you could control the ln by n minus one norm, you recover this, this result. So this is a borderline Calderon Zygmunt result. The only thing you can fault me is then you can say, well, here in your Rn result, you had a vector field. And now you have turned this into a scalar. And I will tell you the reason why we did it. Because when we looked in the literature, we did not find any good reference where people are talking about minus Laplacian u equals f, where f is a vector field. So what is this Laplacian? Is it the Hodge Laplacian? Is it the connection Laplacian? There are all types of things of that type and nobody seems to have worked out uh, any sort of uh, nice theory where you have this sort of relation where the right-hand side is a form or something when m is a Riemannian symmetric space. So because of uh, that, we said, okay, we want an application, we just make this a scalar. And so that is the reason why we, we are just focusing on a scalar here, because we could not find any, any good reference to, to, to understand the, this equation conceptually on, on a Riemannian manifold. So it might be a nice project to, to, to remove this dot product and say, okay, take the previous inequality, and just apply it uh, to minus Laplacian equals F, because there is no, no, no Calder, even calderon zygmunt theory for differential forms on a Riemannian symmetric space. There is calderon zygmunt theory by Stein, by Clerk, by uh, Lehu, and so on. And so we could combine those estimates with the previous inequality and get this application. So it would be a good thing to, to see whether you can remove this fee. Okay, I will list down some other problems at the end, so let's keep going. Okay, now we come to a, a first step, another application, and this is to, to the Navier-Stokes. And so the question here is, so this is in the, nothing symmetric or anything, this is just Rn, uh, R2 a space and one time, and we all know that this is the Navier-Stokes equation, and I'm looking at the incompressible case, nu is the viscosity, p is the pressure, and so on. 
and I'm assuming the density is identically one in this. Okay? So this has been normalized. So my vector field is the velocity vector and V, v is V1, V2. So I'm interested here in the vorticity, which we all know is the curl of V. So this is, uh, this is uh, my main interest. Now it turns out that in, this is why 2D is easier, that this vorticity is actually uh, points only in the K direction in 2D because here, this is what it is. So the, if you look at this scalar, it's this vorticity. Uh, is, this is the formula for the vorticity. And it turns out that the vorticity uh, satisfies uh, an equation by itself. So this is the equation for vorticity. And so you, mm, the vorticity equation has a initial prescribed value. Now, if you know the, the vorticity, then you can always get the velocity because there is this formula which is known, which is also the same formula known in, in for uh, electromagnetism, for magnetism, which is known as the Biosauer law. And that says that, you know, you, you simply, you take the curl of the curl of V and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, you manipulate and then you see that, uh, that uh, you end up with this thing. So if I solve for the vorticity, I can always solve for the velocity. So what is my question? So my question is that I would like to know uh, the weakest condition on the vorticity so that the velocity is bounded. So I just want bounded up, up to time zero velocity, bounded in, <clears throat> bounded in both space, all of space, and bounded up to a certain time. So what is the weakest condition you can give on this initial vorticity? And what I'm claiming here is that if you assume that the initial vorticity is in this uh, BV space, which is W1 derivative in L1, homogeneous. So I'm not assuming that this is in L1. I'm just assuming the gradient of this is in L1. That's all I need. Then up to this time, okay, there is a, this is a uniform constant. This is the viscosity and this is the initial vorticity. Up to this time, you can control all these terms <coughs> and you can also control the, also control the pressure. And this A A0 is exactly uh, the initial vorticity. So th this is a theorem, and if you try to weaken the if you try to weaken the initial condition, let's say you you can you can weaken this to instead of saying the gradient is in L1, you can just say this is a measure, and so now uh, this has been done by many people uh, uh, that the initial vorticity is a measure. Uh, there are people uh, like uh, Giga, Miyakawa, Osada, Toshio Kato, Benazzi, and Heimbridges. They all have looked at this when the initial uh, vorticity is a measure, and they find that the initial velocity is bounded by t to the minus one half as t goes to zero. So uh, this thing here potentially blows up. Now you can say this is a lower bound, so that doesn't say that this blows up. Um, you know, this could still be finite, and this this could be a very bad estimate that they have. But the answer is no. This estimate is actually sharp. That is, if you try to assume the initial vorticity is a measure, you are not going to get the previous inequal, uh, previous result. So the, the, the example is this so-called lamb ocean vortex, and very well known in fluid mechanics since 1912 when, when uh, uh, either lamb or ocean or both uh, discovered it independently. And you assume the initial vorticity is just a Dirac mass with a constant at the origin. And then you find that the, the propagation of the velocity at any, the vorticity at any time is given by this uh, Gaussian. The velocity is given by, by this. <clears throat> and you find that you have all these things and you see here that the, in fact, what was obtained by Kas, uh, Kato and others is actually asymptotically correct. So if you assume anything weaker, and so now you can, uh, bump and boost this uh, example so that you can look at fractional derivatives in L1 and you get the same result that you're not going to be able to get that as time goes to zero, the, the soup norm of the velocity is bounded. So you are still going to fail and that condition that, that you have uh, is actually uh, optimal that the gradient of the initial vorticity has to be in L1. 
that that is the weakest you can do to obtain that the velocity remains bounded as time goes to zero. So this example has been worked out, as I point out, with the um, viscosity constant equal to one. Okay. Now, so so th these these examples are uh, th this application and the next application are due to uh, Van Schaftigen, Polam, Young, and myself. And so is uh, the next application. So the next application is to electromagnetism, and in particular to Maxwell equation. Now, so they are we we know what these Maxwell equations are, and uh, now it turns out that uh, if you look at the magnetic vector field and you manipulate this magnetic vector field, then you find out that the magnetic vector field uh, uh, satisfies this equation. So it's a, it's a wave equation, so you need to have uh, two initial conditions. Now, what is remarkable about this is the right-hand side has divergence zero. J is called the current density vector in the physics literature. And you can see that for every time, for every time, this right-hand side has divergence zero. And so what happens is that this is exactly the setup in which uh, Paul Am Young and I had proved a Strickhardt's inequality for, uh, for a uh, wave equation and Schrodinger equation where the right-hand side is a vector field whose divergence is zero for every time. So this equation fits into that. And when you, when you apply uh, our Strickhardt's inequality to, to that situation, this is what you get. So uh, I, I, I will ask you to just ignore these things. This is, a, this is the standard story of, 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 the, of the wave equation. It's called wave compatibility. And this comes because of the scaling and so on. And if you are really interested in how these things come, then there is a fat book of Terry Tao. Uh, I think his NSF, CVMS notes, and so on. Uh, where this is given. The, what is the key point of this result? In all these Strickhardt's inequalities, you will see LP in space, okay? Every time that you have a Strickhardt's inequality, they're always doing LP in space. But because of the divergence zero condition, you end up with L1 in space all over here. You see, there, here, you see this is the right-hand side. And so whenever you have a Strickhardt's inequality, they will always have LP in space, something in time. But here the point is that I can use the power of the burgan brzezinski inequality and get something better than what, what is normally done, what is, what is standard or classically done. I can get it better and I can end up with L1 in space. So that is the key point of this. That was the point of our original Strickhardt's inequality. We could, bo we could boost it. And so then we end up here with L1 in space. And so you see that you have a better estimate. And this was one way of saying, giving an application of, uh, of that Strickhardt's inequality. And there is a similar result that we have for uh, Schrodinger, but uh, I mean, I am not writing any application here. So I just want, we just wanted an application for, for the wave equation. And, and so here is one application. Okay. So, um, so now I want to uh, say a few words about, uh, about this, uh, this uh, proof uh, of, uh, of this result, okay? So, so the idea of the, of the proof is, uh, as I said, it is based on, uh, on some sort of a slicing, uh, slicing principle. And so what we want to do is we, we take one of these horror cycles, okay? And uh, the idea here is that uh, if you take a new, remember, so, so let, me, let me go back. All right, so here we are. So I think this is the picture, okay. So, so here is the picture you should keep in mind. This is the example of the upper half, Poincare upper half plane. And this is, a, this is the normal. This is, your, this is a horocycle. As I said, horocycles are, uh, circles with the center at infinity. So here, the, the center is somewhere here, it's up there. And so this is my, the domain omega that will, will appear. And then there is some unit norm. So the horocycles can be this, because in this, in this horocycle, the center, is, this is the center. And in this horocycle, the center is up there. Okay. All right. 
So, so here is uh, S is the boundary of omega. We now know what, what omega is. And uh, this D sigma G is, uh, is, is some sort of volume measure. So it could be, in our case, it's just DX, the one that uh, our case means in the example case, in the example case of the Poincare upper half plane. It's, it's more complicated in, in the general case. But in the case of the Poincare upper half plane, the example that I wrote down for you, it is nothing else but dx over y. So there is dx over y, and, and, and really speaking, in, by scaling and so on, you can take, if you wish, you can take y to be 1. So the key, um, uh, key uh, fact that is used in proving our main result is this inequality. So nu it was that normal to s. Okay, and um, and you want to prove this this sort of inequality. Okay, so I could try to uh, so this and then uh, and then what you do is that you break up you break up your uh, integral over uh, the upper half space into some sort of averages over these horocycles. So that is what I am saying is my foliation. So you see, I'm, I'm sort of foliating. I'm foliating my upper half plane into these uh, lit slices by means of these horocycles. So that's, this is what I mean. So if you have a Riemannian manifold, you might not have this sort of foliation. But these symmetric spaces have this sort of foliation. And, and then what is also needed is these geodesics. So when you average, you can sort of use these uh, Horocycles parameterize the whole space by these horocycles and the perpendicular to this, which has the geodesic, and you hope that this geodesic doesn't come back to itself because then that's bad news. So, so you need this sort of geometry to uh, to actually prove the theorem that you have foliations and that's directed, so to say, by by geodesics, and these geodesics don't close on itself. Okay. So, uh, so, so, so th this is the heart of the matter. So I want to give you some idea as to how to uh, uh, prove this result. So, um, so in this half space model, you have uh, this metric. We all know here is the measure. And these are the orthonormal frame of tangent vectors. And this is the guy which is normal. And uh, there is this connection, so on and so forth, and so on. So this I do not want to get into. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the case when y is one, this is my horocycle, and my omega is y bigger than one, as in the picture, and, and I'm go I've rewritten my estimate in terms of my e1 and e2, so my normal is e2. Okay, so, so now what do I do is that I first <coughs> notice that I have, uh, simply by using Green's theorem, so to say, Okay, so this is just uh, that if you have a psi here, which is a, any uh, smooth compactly supported function and you have this, then you can move this inside and apply the divergence zero condition and you can show that the left hand side is equal to this. So this is just by using the divergence zero condition and Green's theorem. So just keep this in mind. So this is very easy to do in our model case, right? In, so. So, so I'm, all, I'm, I'm just doing this for the model example, and let's forget about all these generalities of arbitrary symmetric spaces. It is more complicated to do with them. Okay, now, so here comes what I would say would be the Littlewood Paley part, okay? So what you have to do is you have to take your function, that smooth function that we have, and you, want, you have to break it up into two pieces. So this is basically, if you were doing some sort of Littlewood Paley theory, it's like taking the Fourier transform and cutting it off at high frequency and low frequency. So there's a low frequency part, high frequency part. You do not have to do any dyadic decomposition in this. In, in that's all we need here. So nothing fancy like doing things dyadically or anything. It's just one big piece, which is the low frequency part, and one big piece, which is the high frequency part. So by doing that, so you can show that you can break this function up into two pieces, phi1 and phi2, 
and phi one has this property and now this is on s itself while phi two has the property that it's gradient but now in all of h2 is bounded by this so so this is this is a this is uh, this decomposition is key and here i mean because here it in in the model case it's very easy to do why because our horror cycle was just r so you can just do the fourier analysis on r now you can imagine that if you have a symmetric space in general that horror cycle is not going to look like r it's going to be much more complicated and in fact it could be the heisenberg group itself it could be nilpotent so you have to do some sort of very uh, uh, a different analysis than what I'm just doing here in this simple-minded case. You might have to look, that's where some manipulation of root systems comes in because you have to understand or realize that that uh, horocycle part is actually a nilpotent group with dilations. And so it does turn out that it is a nilpotent group with appropriate dilations and that is enough for us to do, do some sort of analysis on, on that horocycle part. Here, there is nothing to do because you, you have a nice picture. You see it's a, it was a horizontal line. You say, okay, I'll just use a regular Fourier transform. I'll break everything up and I will you know, do whatever I want to do. And this is what you end up getting. So it's a completely easy in the model case. Okay? And so, uh, so what you do now is uh, you take this phi. So this is what you wanted to prove and you, you uh, break it up and you write it as phi one plus phi two. So you use the decomposition we just did and you write it as phi one plus phi two. So here there is a, there is a mistake here. There's a typo. It should, not be, it should not be phi one, but phi one dot E2 and phi two dot E2. So that's missing. The dot product with, with E2 is missing. So you just, uh, just uh, replace this by, but now, by phi one plus phi two, but now for this this guy is very easy to handle. Why? Because uh, recall that phi one was bounded. So you see, uh, this is the part which you say, oh, this is the easy part because it's like saying, uh, you know, like what you would have liked to have done in the past. Uh, just take the the absolute value inside. So just take the absolute value inside here and and pull the um, L one infinity norm out. And this thing here can be just controlled by this because this is where you did the little wood paley. Now, how about this? Well, for this part, what you can do is you can use your integration by parts, your Green's theorem, and move the gradient into here because of that second lemma. But now what about this? Well, that has L infinity norm bounded on all of L infinity of H2. Now you pull it out. So uh, what you do is you, you end up with two estimates. This one for the um, uh, low frequency part and this one for the high frequency part. And then, so now what you have is that you can, the, the, original S, the original expression that you have is going to be a sum of these two and then choose the lambda appropriately so as to minimize the two expressions. And that is exactly, as I say, say here, add the two estimates, minimize over lambda, and you get the desired estimate. And so then, so here I, I talk a little bit more as, as to in a very, very simple case, I'm just showing you how you do this decomposition in R uh, and so on. And, and so, but anyhow, I, I would rather say a few words about some uh, uh, open problems and not go on to that. So here are some open problems that, that came to my head. One pro open problem is what are the sharp constants for this inequality in the Rn case? Now in R2, there is some work by Bregis and Van Schaftingen, and this is uh, related to the P Laplacian, and as you would think that it is uh, related to, remember the closed curve, it is related to isoparametric inequality and circles and so on. And, but nothing has been done in three and higher dimension. So uh, it's a nonlinear PDE that you get if you try to understand this. So this is one question. Another question is, can you extend in all these results for some symmetric spaces to Riemannian manifolds? If you follow this approach, you need a good foliation, you need no closed geodesics and all of that. 
So if you want to do it in complete generality, you probably will have to find a completely different proof than the one given here. But whatever it is, I would suspect whatever proofs there are, they will have to involve a heavy use of some geometry. All right, now we come to Strickhardt's inequalities. I explained to you that Strickhardt's inequalities with this L1 on the right side were obtained by Polam and myself, and then you saw the applications. Now there is some, some uh, uh, work by, by, uh, uh, by, so by Sire and myself, but this is way too special. It is hardly uh, very satisfactory. It's probably in, in uh, dimension two and so on. So there is a whole bunch of Strickhardt's inequalities that you would like to prove. So this work of Sire is in the symmetric space uh, setup. So in the symmetric space setup, can you prove analogs of the Strickhardt's inequalities for wave and Schrodinger equation that were proved on RN by, by Polam and myself? So this is another avenue. Uh, I do not think that these results are of much uh, great significance because they are really using energy inequalities. They're not really even utilizing anything serious about uh, Strickhardt's inequalities. This one, of course, we have to use you know, restriction, all of that. Here it is just uh, fooling around with energy inequalities. So there is a whole lot of work that needs to be done. This is, of course, in the setup of symmetric spaces and so on and so forth. So again, uh, you have to be careful. There are no closed geodesics because you get caustics and so on and so forth. And so these are some of the problems that I, I could think of that to me sounds uh, somewhat interesting. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I didn't make an ass of myself in my first attempt in this sort of uh, way of giving you a talk. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much, Sagun. It was a very, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now, so now I, I will invite the audience, if, if anyone wants to ask any question, please feel free. Um, uh, hello. Hi, uh, uh, Sagun. It's Galia. Thank you very much for Oh, this. thank you very much for inviting me. You know, yeah. this has been wonderful. Yeah. It's a really nice talk and, and really very clear. Um, I guess that maybe, um, do you want to, maybe it's too, too much, but do you want to say um, a bit more about why closed geodesics are such an enemy or? Yeah, I can tell you that. You see, it's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, so, so suppose, I, suppose I want to write a function as the indefinite integral of uh, f prime, right? Now, if you go from one point to another, so you have one point to another point, you can write f of x equals integral um, a minus infinity to x of f prime of t, correct? Now, if you have a closed geodesic, you, you get into trouble, right? It's sort of, it's not easy. What do, what do we mean by, by writing a function as the integral of its derivative? It, it, it's not clear. And uh, so suppose the integral of a function over any closed geodesic is zero. Yeah, uh, so then, 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 yeah, so then, then you can modify, but then that's a condition, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, I think, so uh, there's a th theorem of Lifshitz, right, in dynamical system that uh, if you have a function in the union sphere bundle and the integral over all those geodesics uh, is zero in negative curvature, then it is a derivative with respect to geodesic flow of something else. Yeah. So and, and there are some regularity versions due to like Svetlana Katok and other people. Uh, but, but, but will it be useful uh, in extending if you assume uh, your result to maybe more general manifolds which have closed geodesic if you assume uh, that the integral is zero over any closed geodesic. Yeah, but uh, there is also the other thing, right? I mean, the way we are doing it, we need these foliations, right? So it's, yeah. not, it's not just that, right? There is so, a, you, you're somehow, you're taking averages over some things and then uh, summing up over all those averages with the sums and the, the vector which is directing this is the geodesic, right? Which is sort of orthogonal to all these. But the uh, well, in, in general, you, you can have like stable and stable foliations with respect to geodesic flow. And also in non-positive curvature, uh, there are these 
uh, you know, uh, there are, there are uh, analogs of Cora cycles, uh, like level sets of Guzman functions. Yeah, correct. Uh, which, so, so maybe you could use those, uh, and they, they are somehow more general mm -hmm. uh, than just... Yeah. So uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of this, so maybe we should, one should look into it, and so thank you for pointing all of this out, because uh, I will, uh, at least, uh, I, at least I'm, I'm saying for myself, I don't know about my co-authors, I was not aware of uh, that there is a lot of work, as you're pointing out, in this direction uh, already. Um, but also there is the, in the case of, however, Strickhardt's inequalities, you have to be very careful anyhow of closed geodesics because they, they create problems. Uh, you know, if you have closed geodesics, you don't have good Strickhardt's inequalities. Like if you are on the sphere, uh, you don't really have very good Strickhardt's inequalities because you, you go through, you go through the, from the south to the north pole, uh, you know, this sort of bouncing around is, is, is not good for, for, for Strickhardt's estimate. Yeah, so okay. there, but, certainly but, there are difficulties. But but the negative curvature there is somehow much less focusing than uh, yes, than on yes, the sphere. So, yes, so, so I, I, I agree. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you are going to use negative curvature, uh, there is there is no focusing, and so things are definitely better. But at the same time, I don't think there are some any good results uh, in general negative curvature regarding Strickhardt's inequalities, even in the scalar case. Mm -hmm. So I'm mean, here. We are talking of vector case, but even in the scalar case, I don't think there are many uh, good results. I think people know on hyperbolic space uh, on that you can you can get uh, some sort of Strickhardt's inequalities, but uh, but on general negative curvature, I'm, I don't think they have been written down. Oh, okay, hmm. interesting. I think there is a person called Anker. In, in Lyon, A-N-K-E-R, and he has some papers with somebody called Pierre Felice. And I actually, I wrote down Strickhardt's inequalities for uh, class functions. It, this, this was like a joke some years ago, I was fooling around. And you can do it for, you know, class functions are the analogs of radial functions on RN. You can mm -hmm. get Strickhardt's inequalities then. But the idea was that it, it somehow turned into the problem back on RN, and so you could do it that way. Um, but um, in general, that uh, Anker's result is all I know. So there is a little paper of mine many years ago of, for these class functions and Strigard's inequalities. So that's, yeah. that's, that's what I know. And uh, so another question, do you know, uh, the Nuremberg problem is somehow is prescribing scalar curvature. Uh, comes no, Gauss curvature. Gauss curvature, sorry. Uh, I, I, so in higher dimensions, uh, some... Uh, That's the Yamagi problem. So, uh, but, but is, is there some differential form uh, uh, version of Yamabe? Because uh, if, uh, right, I mean, in, in higher dimensions, uh, Yamabe for scalar is somehow has been solved, but uh, yeah. So 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 there are okay. So so uh, there are higher these higher dimensional conformal geometry. Okay, so higher analog. So there are higher higher forms of curvature. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, but 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 maybe not like not the Q curvature prescription or not, uh, you, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. You don't because want th that. These are higher order operators, but for scalars, but uh, for, uh, something for differential oh, okay. forms. It, no, it could, I, it, I don't know. Could... I'm not, not, not aware of uh, um, conformal geometry beyond, you know, things that are, you know, like these, uh, um, uh, you know, the sigma two and the, but this, this is not what you want. I mean, I, just... I mean, I, I want maybe more like, uh, you know, Branson Gower, that kind of stuff, the, the, the tractor. Uh, yeah, tractor calculus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, this is something I can ask my my collaborator Paul Yang. He yeah. he probably will tell me. But at at, at the moment, I, I I don't know. 
uh, I guess it would be nice to have a vector know, version of that. A good question. It's a very good question. It's a natural question. You right. know, whether you, you, you can have this for forms, I mean, it's very natural because, I mean, you have this, as you, as you point out, for scalars, but what are the analogs for, you know, for forms? Because then you can also have uh, the various anti-symmetries playing some role there right. in the equation. I mean, like, what, what, what would you do if you have a Hodge version of, of, the, of the Yamabe equation? Right, no, uh, because, because uh, for differential forms, I think you have some, some kind of analogs of, uh, of operators that act on forms, uh, but... Uh, well, for, for the, you see, the problem is that for the linear part, yes, right? But uh, you, you need to be very careful what you would do with the nonlinear part, right? Right, no, and, and I, think, I think that, like, that's, that's, I guess, estimates like you have would be extremely useful. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 yeah, but I am not aware uh, what is a con what is the what are natural uh, conformal geometry problems for forms, which could be a way of summarizing what you're asking. Right, right. I mean, no, but but maybe it's it's it would be good nice to write this down. <laughs> That's what mm. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you need you need some some study like what Branson did, you know, like for panites and Q curvature and so on, you need at least somebody to say, okay, this is a nice equation to study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then, then you can start to do some analysis in there. But yeah. somebody has to point out a good equation. I'm discussing this some, somehow with Rod Gower at the moment uh, oh, okay. on, a, on, on and off. So, so, so that's, that's, why, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he's the right guy to, to, to talk about this. I mean, he, if anybody, you know, he will know. I mean, uh, yeah, Rod yeah, Gower and, and the people around him. You know, right. um, you know uh, Robin uh, Graham and Rod, th these are people who probably have uh, some ideas. Mm -hmm. But I would I would bet on Rod. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, no, I'll I, I would bet on him to find the good equation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Is, is anyone would uh, have any question to ask? If uh, no other question, I'll thank you again very much. Uh, thank Segu. you. I mean, it's been a pleasure.